even know how many people there are. I should be able to tell you after. Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the Target Jobs Virtual National Pupillage Fair. Um, if this is your first time joining us, my name's Matt. I'm one of the editors on Target Jobs Law and for the Pupillages Handbook, which should be posted to you if you signed up to the fair. Um, I, we have decided to do something a little bit different this year um, because there has been a lot of talk, as you, if you've been attending the talks program today, as you will have heard, um, about diversity at the bar and the, you know, the various different um, uh, chambers making making efforts to, to have a broader uh, diversity of people as, as part of their pupillage programs. Um, and we just wanted to to kind of ask people to share some of their stories to, to show that the bar, you know, that any the type of person that can make it at the bar. Um, and we've invited three people here today who are just going to tell us a little bit about um, their experiences of, of getting into tenancy and starting practice. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody who's joined us today because I really do appreciate you um, taking the time to speak to everyone. Uh, I don't know who would like to start. We, uh, I, sh I should introduce our speakers first, would probably be a good idea. We have Elizabeth Gallagher from Temple Garden Chambers, um, who I don't know if everybody's screen is the same, is in my top left. Um, Krista Lee QC from Keating Chambers um, and Rianne McKenzie from Henderson Chambers. Um, I'm going to hand you over to our panel and who would like to start? Um, Elizabeth, because you're in the yeah, top Yeah, that's head. fine. I don't mind going first. <laughs> Um, hello everyone. Um, so I thought maybe I could just tell you a teeny bit about my chambers first, so you um, know the sort of law that I practice in. Um, at TGC we uh, chiefly practice in personal injury and public law, but within those two sort of broad um, headings we do lots of, um, lots of different types of law as well, so that encompasses things such as um, insurance, inquests and inquiries, cost law, civil fraud, health and safety, uh, extradition, public international law, um, just to name a few. So um, I'll tell you a bit about um, me. Um, I am originally from Bradford in West Yorkshire. So um, as you listen to me uh, today, you'll probably be able to, to pick up on my accent. Um, it comes and goes, it depends, uh, how, uh, yeah, depends what mood I'm in as to how strong it is. Um, I was called to the bar in 2014. Um, and I became a tenant at um, TGC in 2015. I studied French and history at Durham University and I did the graduate diploma in law. So if you're watching this and you um, don't have a law degree, um, it's you know, much to be said about um, diversity in, in, in that respect as well. Um, so yeah, when I tell um, barristers that I grew up in Yorkshire, they often have a, an idea in their head of um, somewhere perhaps in the countryside, somewhere maybe um, quite tranquil, uh, quite leafy, uh, very nice. Uh, that is not what Bradford is like, if you've ever been to Bradford. Um, I grew up about 10 minutes from the city centre um, in an area that is in the top 10% uh, most deprived areas in the country. So um, yeah, that was a, a, a background that's probably very different to lots of people um, at the bar. But it certainly wasn't something that um, that held me back, though obviously I think there were challenges that, that came with that, um, and I'll um, explore those uh, a little bit further uh, as I as I talk to you today. And um, so I'm the first generation in my family to go to university. I am the first uh, lawyer in my family. I'm the first person to live in London. So um, in lots of respects, everything that I'm doing is completely alien. Uh, to everybody else in my family and it's also you know just they think it's all a bit weird uh, and you know to be fair um, life at the bar has its has its quirks so um, maybe they're not entirely wrong uh, in that respect. I suppose um, I first decided I wanted to be a barrister partly because I watched um, probably too many TV shows about American lawyers and I, um, I thought that's what um, being a barrister would be about. Uh, obviously, as I um, did some work experience and I learned more about the profession, I realised that that was completely wrong. Um, but it still really appealed to me because um, I love talking. Um, I've always really enjoyed public speaking. I wanted to be an actress at one point when I was a teenager. So um, that side of, of being a barrister really suited me. And I think um, you'll find a lot of frustrated actors at the bar. There is something very theatrical 
um, about prancing around in court um, and sort of, yeah, holding, holding an audience, whether that's the, um, the jury or the judge. The difficulty was, of course, as I said, I didn't know anybody else um, from my family who'd done anything like this. Um, and we didn't really have any family friends either um, who were lawyers. And when I, I, you know, I remember when I first told my mum, oh, I think mum, I, I want to be a, a barrister. She, she, she really didn't think that that was something that, um, that people like us did. And um, she, you know, she tried to, to put me off to begin with, um, that it really wouldn't be um, the, the right thing for me to do. Um, I think, to be honest, she was frightened. Um, it all seemed quite overwhelming. Um, and let's just say, members of my family on one side are perhaps more likely to um, encounter the law um, in the context of being in trouble with the law rather than, um, um, yeah, as, as a lawyer. Um, but there was, um, there was a turning point really um, for, for me and my mum, um, which was when we read Cherie Blair's autobiography. And um, she was from uh, a working class background. And she talks a lot in, in this book about, um, yeah, about the, the kind of challenges that she'd experienced, but actually how, you know, if she could be a barrister, then, then anybody could. Um, and that was a real, it was a real turning point because it gave me, it gave me someone who quite, who inspired me. Um, and it gave my mum a real life example that she could see, well, actually it is for people like us. Um, and, you know, both my parents were always very supportive, but I think from that point on, um, you know, my mum in particular became uh, a real cheerleader for me. So when I was, you know, thinking about this talk and, and maybe some of the, the barriers that you kind of face maybe when you're from a, a, a lower socioeconomic background, um, this, the fact of not knowing anyone and not having anyone to sort of set an example for you um, and to encourage you and tell you how to, to break into the field seemed to me to be um, maybe one of the, the main barriers. But then I think also the other one is probably education. So, um, you know, I went to a really, really bad school um, and, uh, you know, it was a real challenge to, to get the, the grades that were, that were, that were really needed um, in order to pursue this career. Um, and then quite by fluke, um, I ended up going to a very good university. It was completely unintentional. Um, I, you know, I only went there because my vicar's daughter had gone there. So again, this idea of having someone who can be an example for you is, is really key. Um, but, you know, I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, but it's not the end of the world. Um, and so, you know, there's maybe a perception that you have to have gone to Oxford or Cambridge to succeed at the bar, but that's, um, that's really not the case. And certainly at my chambers, you know, we have quite a few people at the junior end who, who didn't. So there's no one size fits all model um, for being a barrister. I'm thinking then about kind of how that has impacted me as I've, um, you know, kind of got on my feet and, and, you know, got into practice. I guess if I'm, people talk a lot about imposter syndrome. Um, I would say, it's not that like I have imposter syndrome, but I think I do feel like an outsider. And um, I think that that's, that's kind of true in two respects. You know, sometimes I do feel like an outsider at the bar, maybe because my background is different to lots of other people's. But I think also by becoming a barrister, I kind of sometimes feel like an outsider with my family and with the people that I, that I grew up with. And, um, you know, I think maybe that's a kind of, a side effect of social mobility but I actually think it can be it doesn't have to be a negative thing it can be really positive because I think you know when you have that sense of maybe being slightly outside a system you're in it but you can see it for what it is and I think it's you know having that perspective and um, people like that they can they can make a real difference and they can they can change systems and so you know part of why I'm for example on my chambers equality and diversity committee is helping to be part of um, you know, changing some respects in which maybe the bar hasn't been um, most welcoming for people from, from different backgrounds. Um, but I think also it's important to recognise the strengths that you can bring when you have these, these diverse life experiences. So part of why I chose to practice in um, personal injury law, which is what I do most of the time, is that, you know, it's all about real people. And my, you know, my whole life has been 
sort of learning how to explain things to my parents in a way that they can understand. And actually, when you've got a client, a real person, and they need to understand what their case is about, what the judge is going to say, how it's going to work, how the law affects that, um, which, you know, comes up with part and parcel, really, of, of what we do in personal injury law. Um, that ability to, to, to explain things to real people is really important. And very often, I don't meet my clients until the day of the trial. And suddenly, in about 30 minutes, I've got to build a rapport with them. They've got to trust me. And I think, you know, being able to relate to and interact with people from all sorts of different backgrounds and particularly just normal people actually really helps my clients have confidence in me, I hope. Um, so I think I've been talking for rather a long time now. Um, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, I'm afraid barristers will like the sound of our own voice. Um, I've just been asked by um, one thing by our... Um, Chambers Pupillage um, Committee is to plug an event that we're having, which is a, a Q and A uh, over Zoom about our pupillage um, process. And if you're on the target jobs mailing list, then you should get an email invite to that. Um, our pupillage application process is one of the areas where, as a Chambers, we're trying to encourage and support diversity. So we do um, blind recruitment, for example, um, and you can find out more about that if you go to um, this event. So shall I? Um, Hand over to Krista. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you for inviting me to talk this afternoon. Um, so the panel is about diversity, but I think where I want to start is what makes us all the same at the bar. Uh, first of all, and, and um, Elizabeth was a great example of, of, what, of this. Everyone has strong and persuasive presentation skills. It might be that you're better orally in court. It might be that you're better in writing. And what that means where you are is that you love debating, you love meeting, or you love drama. You love the theater of court or of life, just life, everyday people's stories. Secondly, everyone at the bar who I've met has strong analytical ability. They like solving problems. They like reading through the witness statements, reading through the evidence, working out what's happened. Uh, thirdly, we are all passionate about representing other people. We want to talk for other people. We want to bring their cases to court and argue their case. We would work long hours and stay up all night if we thought it was going to make a difference to our client the next day. And fourthly, um, we all have what I would call the resilience to be self-employed. If you come to the bar, you have to build your own career. You have to take responsibility for day one for your clients and for any case. You've not got a partner behind you who's going to take responsibility. It's your responsibility. And thirdly, you have to have the resilience to ride the insecurity of the bar. Wherever you are, whether you're the criminal bar, the civil bar, the commercial bar, there is an insecurity from having variable caseload and variable earnings. So if you have those four things, strong presentation skills, strong analytical ability, you're passionate about representing others, and you have this resilience to take being self-employed, my firm belief is that there is a place at the bar for you. You can find a space for you, for yourself at the bar, doing an area of law that suits your particular characteristics. Now, uh, from my perspective, what I really like, and I think this is common with a lot of barristers, I like stories. And um, just like Elizabeth, who, uh, who had Sherry Blair, the person, my first hero as it was, was P Baroness Patricia Scotland. She is now the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Nations, but she was born in the Dominica. She did her degree. She got, very interestingly, uh, her degree she got from the University of London as an external student. She was at Mid-Essex Technical College. Um, and in 1991, which was when I started out very many years ago. Um, she was the first woman from the Caribbean to be appointed Queen's Counsel. And she came and she spoke to us when we were at university and it was incredibly powerful. And she has inspired me throughout my career. But she is not the only, what I would describe, hero at the bar. And one of the difficulties with the Zoom event is that we can't see what you look like. Um, so uh, it's about diversity. And there are very many people who I've met who have inspired me. I'm gonna tell you a few. Uh, first, it's a girl I was at college with, she's called Emma Satyamurti. 
and she's now a partner at Lee Day and she specializes in employment law. And she has a, a, a congenital syndrome, which means that she's quite small, she's four foot, she has stiff joints and she has weak muscles. But nonetheless, if you look her up and you'll find her story on the internet, she is described as a confident negotiator. She's strong and persuasive presentation skills, like I said. Um, but one of the amazing things about her and the law is that her, her firm has completely embraced her and they do an annual London to Manchester bike ride. And she did this and you've got to go and read her story because it's completely amazing how her team got together so that she could as well do this bike ride and they fashioned a bike so that she could do this with her colleagues. My next hero is a guy called Edward Ho, who's a barrister at Brick Court. Um, and in 2009, he was described as probably one of the best brains at the junior bar. He was one of the stars of the bar in 2016 in the Lawyer magazine, and he was also in the Hot 100 2017. So these are all recent accolades for Edward Ho. Eight years ago, he fractured his spinal column in a snowboard accident, and he's still in a wheelchair. And he's in the chambers, Brick Court is next door to my chambers, I'm at Keating, Keating Chambers. He comes to work driving independently, gets into his wheelchair, his clerks help him. But all these accolades about him being at the star at the bar and he's in a wheelchair. Uh, the next person I would I'd say, you've got to look up their story about. Again, it's difficult because we can't see you. But anyway, she's called Brie Hall Stevens and she's a silk um, at Hardwick Chambers. And the way she describes herself as pansexual says female. And she writes about very positively about her experience at the bar with her clients and her clerks. And I've met her, been working with her recently on actually a, a, a black inclusion group following BLM. She is so lovely and open. And that is the way she has lived her life at the bar, open with everybody around her, with her clients and her clerks. And we can see she's successful. She, she's got silk. And... Um, her advice to LGBT lawyers, and again, this is all in the public domain, because all these people feel the need to share their stories so as to inspire whoever you are to come to the bar because there is space for you. And her advice is um, be true to yourself, be authentic. Uh, you will not perform at your best if you are not. Um, and she says, reach out. There are all sorts of associations when you, and networking groups when you look for them. So there's free bar, blag and interlaw. Um, and then I suppose I should tell you about myself. <laughs> um, so my mother uh, came from Jamaica. She was part of the Windrush generation. Uh, she came here to train as a, a, a nurse. She's a registered nurse, practiced in the NHS all her life. Uh, so we grew up in London, um, in Neasden. If you know um, George the Poet, quite near George the Poet. Um, and we went to the, I went to the local state school. Um, and then senior school as well, comprehensive, and was lucky to get into Oxford. I say lucky for two reasons. One, I picked the college with the most uh, largest number of law students to increase my chances, because um, generally there are only one or two, but the college I went to had 11. And when I went up for uh, interview, I thought it would just be an interview, but actually they gave me a paper. And the paper they gave me was on civil commotion, um, and Martin Luther King. I could have written about this till the cows came home. So that was great. So anyway, I went to Oxford. Then getting pupillage, actually, it is a struggle for everyone. Uh, and that was slightly more difficult than I anticipated it would be. Um, but, and I had to do two rounds, but I think that's quite common now. I think people do two, three rounds now of pupillage interviews. Um, so, um, but eventually I got into a general civil commercial set, which was actually really good for me because it meant I got to see lots of different areas of practice. Um, so I did personal injury, medical negligence, I did banking, fraud, and I did construction law. And I really wanted, construction law is what I found most interesting and most engaging. So I then did an engineering degree so I could speak to all my technical clients. And then moved to Keating Chambers, um, which is a, a, a very strong construction commercial set. Um, I've been there ever since, been busy ever since, and March earlier this year I got silk, um, which is, um, it's like the Oscars at the bar, to tell you the truth. I'm still excited about it. Um, but I tell you my story to hopefully inspire you, just like all these other people have inspired me.
anyway, I think that's, I think like I've talked enough now. <laughs> so I think um, it's well, over to you, you Larry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris and Elizabeth. Um, it's been fantastic to hear um, your stories. Um, and I think as well, just highlighting, you know, as Krista says, we can't see you, but I think it's important to recognise, you know, you can't be what you can't see. So hopefully panels like this, you can see us and, you know, that gives you hope that the bar is not um, the pale male and stale place it obviously still has the reputation of being and that there is diversity there. It's just not necessarily easy to see that when you're outside of um, the area. I've got to say, I completely agree with Elizabeth. We're all um, would be actors and actresses, uh, but I feel slightly ashamed that my big inspiration for becoming a lawyer was none other than Elle Woods of Legally Blonde fame. Um, and so that's kind of where I um, start from. I, just to give you a little background for, uh, about myself, I'm a tenant at Henderson Chambers. I've been there for um, two and a half years now. I was a third six pupil. So I did my 12 month pupillage at Quadrant Chambers, which was a shipping set, and then did a third six, which was actually a third eight. So in total, I did 20 months of pupillage, which was pretty heavy going. It's quite an exhausting process because it is essentially a year long interview. Um, but I remember doing um, some of my qualification nights, obviously on um, the BPTC, um, and ended up speaking to Dame Elizabeth Gloucester and she reassured me because she took four goes at pupillage before she got um, taken on as a tenant. So I thought, well, if Elizabeth Gloucester takes four goes, I can keep going. Um, so that's what I did there. Um, just a uh, further background, I was at grammar school, then I went to Cambridge and I read history. So I did the conversion course. Um, so that was my route to the bar and one of the things I found um, really helpful is to tap into your kind of university um, careers resources or your alumni networks so um, I think there's definitely still a massive perception of kind of the old boys club um, at somewhere like the bar um, and really you've got to flip that on its head and work it to your advantage so I got my first mini pupillage by writing to um, an old member of my college who was a barrister and he kind of invited me to come and shadow him for a day just so you get your foot in the door. Um, so using those sorts of resources um, are definitely something um, I would recommend and many you know, university career centres will have um, relevant experience they can give you. Um, the BPTC at City, I know that they work really hard with Chambers to get exposure for the students and so that they can get experience. So I just use those um, to your advantage. Um, so in terms of my own kind of element of diversity, because I'm aware that I don't, I don't present as particularly diverse, is I'm dyslexic. Um, so uh, my dyslexia was picked up at university. Um, I essentially I started doing essays and my supervisor started saying you know Rianne you're not putting in any effort on these it's riddled with um, spelling mistakes um, the type of uh, a type of example would be you know I use punitive in the wrong way I thought it meant small um, which it doesn't um, so that was then picked up and then I got extra time in exams and you know that was a really helpful um, thing for me but obviously you then switch into a professional career and the reality is as a professional you can't get given extra time there's no such thing no one's gonna you know treat you differently or expect you know a different quality of work from you just because you're dyslexic or, or whatever it is you have um that said as a pupil and someone applying for pupillage you know the equality act does apply and so um you'll often find in your applications a kind of um equality and diversity monitoring form and I always struggled with um, what to tick when they say about the disability, because I do not consider myself um, disabled. But equally, I would want Chambers to know um, about my dyslexia, because they then can take that into account. The reasonable adjustments have to be considered and that sort of thing. So I found that often what I would do is just write a little note on that um, in a kind of the box on that form, just saying, by the way, I'm dyslexic. And, you know, there's no problem with that, whatever it is you, you have. And, you know, many members of Chambers have children. Their children will have dyslexia. There is no 
kind of stigma around those sorts of kind of specific learning difficulties anymore. And if someone did, you know, you feel discriminate against you for those reasons, then that's actually a breach of the law. They're just not allowed to do that. Um, so I found that in practice, though, um, I needed to come up with a couple of coping mechanisms because, you know, pupillage is intense. You are wanting to get, you know, good reviews, good feedback. You want to get tenancy at the end of it. Um, so I found that what I needed to do was, you know, if someone says, right, I need this piece of work by, you know, X date next week. I would build in my own schedule because I know that I would need, you know, that bit longer to check the work. Um, so I'd print it out, I'd look at it in a PDF um, and just constantly be looking for any of those mistakes um, that you don't want there. And, and I found this really helpful because actually in practice, you know, you want a perfect document to go to court. Um, so it's kind of just been drilled into me because I've had to make sure I wasn't making mistakes um, through the whole pupillage process that just stays with you um, and really kind of sets you in good stead for having you know good control of your documents and good presentation and making sure they're as perfect as they can be um, for your tribunal for the judge or whoever it is who's reading that document um, so I certainly think if you you know it, it's completely up to you whether you disclose any sort of information like that it should not at all be any sort of setback in the application process but obviously I can understand why people might want to keep that confidential. Once you have a pupillage and you are at a chambers, um, you know, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's um, normally equality and diversity committees, there'll be an equality and diversity chair. You just should let them know, um, or the person who's um, the head of the pupillage recruitment committee, that you do have dyslexia and what that might mean for you. Um, or whatever it is your specific learning difficulty or whatever it is I, it's just always better that they know because if they don't know um, no reasonable adjustments can be made and certainly chambers wouldn't want to and you wouldn't want to you know after 12 months of pupillage not get it and find that actually had you just spoken up something could have been done and you would have been on the path to tenancy or whatever it would be um, so I would always just say, flag it where you can. You might not need anything, but you just might want them to know and it doesn't actually change anything. But certainly letting them know is the starting point um, for that sort of thing. Um, so I think that's really all I um, had to say in terms of um, the, the pupillage aspect and kind of being yourself at the bar. I think a second point that's important to remember is you are... Um, becoming a professional um, and you can't really fake your personality for the length of a pupillage um, you know you are there for 12 months you've got to your your true self is always going to come out uh, and I think it's important that that you let it come out because you want to find a chambers that suits you as much as you suit the chambers because the point of being a tenant is that you're there for life and most people never leave the chambers that they start at so you don't really want to get that wrong and just be it's exhausting as it is so it's even more exhausting if you're just trying to force down your true personality um so that's kind of where uh, i'd probably draw this to a close and i hope that's helpful um and thank you matt for inviting us to speak thank you very much to all of you for for talking i i, I should just uh, i just want to add a little bit of context as to how this this session came about because i think it, it is interesting um, we interviewed a lot of students for, for Target Jobs Law a while back, asking them about whether, uh, essentially, we, we found out that a lot of people would sometimes self-censor themselves out of applications for going to the bar or going to even going for major law firms. Um, and it's absolutely heartbreaking to read because we, while we're interviewing those students, we're also interviewing a lot of, uh, you know, barristers who are saying, well, no, our chambers isn't like that. Or no, I'm not like that. Or no, uh, you know, I, I am not just a white Oxbridge male. I am, I, in fact, I went to state school or in fact, I, I'm neurodiverse because I, I, I happen to be on, on the autistic spectrum. And it, it uh, you know, it, 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 we really kind of wanted to invite people just to share a little bit about their life, uh, 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 of what life at the bar is and some of the, the kind of, because it's not straightforward for anyone. It's obviously a very challenging career to take part in. So I'm really grateful that you all, um, that, that, you, that you were willing to, to join us and to, to share a little bit of that. I want to turn this over to questions that are, uh, are coming in. So I'm getting some, I've, I've sort of got a couple jotted down here, but we've got some coming in on the feed. Um, and if you're out there watching this, please do put your questions in the chat box, like any questions so that they move up towards the top of the list. Um, 
we've got the first one here. Uh, I, I can't see the names. On, I'm sorry, but it says I'm a very I'm a very mature student, and in uni at year one, um, I just thought better late than never. Is there any hope for someone starting in their fifties? All my life, I've wanted to represent people, and because in every sphere this law thing always resonates, I thought, why not? So, is there any hope for someone starting in their fifties? Um, answer. I. On my GDL course, there was a man in his 50s, career change. He had been an investment banker, similar story, I think, said, I've actually always wanted to do this, so I might as well try it now. And he just went through the same process. And, yeah, he got pupillage and then did a third six, and now he's a tenant and he's had a career change. So I think it's entirely possible, I think, just to be aware that, obviously, the system is skewed to that, you know, there is that power dynamic of supervisor pupil kind of irrespective of what the ages are and so you are kind of back down to the bottom of the pile making the tea you know being you know seen not heard and sometimes and just generally like observing and learning and being the pupil um so as long as you're prepared to do that and are happy to to muck in I, I don't see why you know chains aren't going to discriminate you against age um and if you want to do it then go for it I, I imagine it would actually be a benefit. I, I know we've mentioned personal injury law and engineering have come into play uh, uh, already as well. I mean, I, I assume if you've been an engineer for a while, it would be useful to go into construction law with that background. Or if you've been in the NHS for a while, it'd be useful to go into personal injury. Would that be fair to say, Krista, Elizabeth? Well, we've so at Keating Chambers, we do have a number of people who have uh, engineering degrees or were first engineers and then came to the bar. Um, that's not to say that by any means you need to be an engineer to be a construction lawyer um, but it is it can be an advantage and it can be an advantage as well as speaking to clients and speaking to specialists that you have you already have the the lingo you already understand um, yeah so we get a lot of and it's not just Keating other chambers as well who practice in construction law have other skills should I say not just a law degree and that can be of benefit thank you I can definitely say that, for example, if, if an application from um, someone in their 50s came to my chambers, that would have no bearing whatsoever on the decision about whether or not to offer them a pupillage. For starters, we'd have no idea how old they were. Um, so, we'd, you know, we'd probably make some assumptions, perhaps based on their um, appearance. But certainly the criteria that we apply, uh, you know, it's about your intellectual um, abilities. It's about your people skills. It's got nothing to do with how old or young you are. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Um, and we got, we've got we got a number of thank yous coming and say thank you very much. Your stories are all really inspiring and reassuring. Um, I just wanted to pass that on because I know we can't see the chat feed where we are sitting behind the Zoom call. Um, I, I just wanted to ask because you a number of you mentioned like, oh, this was my hero. Um, you know, I, the, the, these are people who inspired me. How did you come to find people who inspired you in law when you may not have been, you know, because a lot of people, if, you, if you're, your family are working in, in, in law to begin with, it's very easy to, to come across like a, a wide sort of range of names and, and famous cases they've worked. But how did you come to, to find out about some of the, the sort of, I guess, role models or inspiration um, if, if, you know, if you weren't working in practice at the moment? I'm not sure my answer is very helpful, but it was com it was a complete accident. <laughs> it was a yeah, just happened to be interested in um, in her life, and obviously she was married to someone who was um, pretty uh, important and well known. Um, so yeah, that that was it was it was just it was pure fluke, <laughs> which doesn't really help. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's the same for me, actually. So obviously meeting Patricia Scotland was a was a bit of a fluke. Um, but there's so much potential now for actually looking up people on the Internet. Probably wasn't so much the case uh, when I started out. But even so, my mother bought me the book um, written by Lord Denning at the time. He was sort of the, the people's um, judge. And, you know, honestly, there's TV. It inspires us all. And at the time, there was... Um, Cagney and Lacey was on television um, and uh, they were the it was the first buddy female buddy uh, program on television uh, so I think you can get inspiration from all sorts of places 
And I do know that some people have said to me, well, if I can't see anyone in a chambers that looks like me, surely that place isn't for me. And I think that's really interesting, but I think we all demand that people look more than skin deep and you have to do the same, honestly. And you have to look at the chambers, actually look at the people, look at their policies. Um, and the other thing the other thing I thought was, like, well, if Kamala Harris can be vice president of the US, you all can be just lowly barristers, to, you know, there is no bar, to be honest. I, I think that's actually answered one question that has just come in. And, and this is someone who says, I, I am one of those applicants who generally avoid applying to chambers where my ethnicity or class is not represented, as I would not want to waste my pupillage gateway slots. However, it would be useful to know if the panel would advise against this practice. I think you've, you've just answered that, Krista, but I, I just wanted to highlight that was something that people were, were asking. Um, so we, we have another one in the, uh, sorry, in the column is, how do you go, how did you go about deciding your chambers was potentially the place for you prior to applying? Open to anyone. I think that's really difficult um, because I think as barristers, we have to be specialists to justify people coming to us. So I didn't work out, I wanted to do construction till I got to pupillage. Um, but what I would advise you all to do is go and do many pupillages, not only to work out what area of practice you want to do, but whether the, the chambers, the field of chambers is something that you, somewhere where you think you could thrive. Um, so I, I think it's difficult, honestly, because studying law is so different from practicing it. So the advice has to be just go and go and look, go and talk to as many people as you can, you know, go to chambers events, go to events like this, um, just do your research. Yeah, I, I, sorry, just to jump in, I'd say I would 100% agree. And also just to recognise it is a numbers game. So once you know broadly if it's civil, family or crime, because those are the three big silos, then exactly as Krista says, just try and get experience in as many as you can, see if you like the feel of the place. And just, I'm a big believer in chucking in as many applications as you can. So in the gateway, outside the gateway, because all you need is one pupillage to get your foot in the door, you know, and then to have done the training, become a tenant. And then, you know, you can laterally move and funnel down wherever you then decide, actually, I'm more interested in that. Um, but starting off quite broadly gives you the best chance to at least get in uh, and then you can specialise as you get more senior. Elizabeth, does that hold true for you as well? Yes, I would agree. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> No worries. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on one last very quick point before we uh, before I think we're going to have to wrap this up. Um, just Krista, because you mentioned the resilience of being self-employed. Um, and I think that's something that, that we uh, we've talked with Target Jobs has talked about in the past, which is there is a, a nervousness if you are not from a you know, you're not well funded and you're not not able to just do what you want without sort of financial penalty. Um, you, you can, it can be quite worrying to go to look at the bar where you're self-employed, extremely competitive um, to get to. And, and then to look at other places where you might have, well, we're, we're a company and we provide health insurance and we provide sick leave and, and things. So it, is there anything you would recommend to anyone out there who, who how to develop that resilience to, to make that jump, to go self-employed? Is there any, any tips you would advise? Well, honestly, I think that well, I'm, I, don't, I can't see who I'm looking at, but a lot of you will be just starting your careers. You'll be young. If you don't take risks now, you know, when is the time? So. If you have all the qualities, if you're passionate about being an advocate, I would say take the risk. Um, but yes, it is insecure. But what I would say you can do is that now all pupillages are funded. And you can tell from that level of that funding where you might start off your earnings as a, as a tenant. I'd say it would be really unusual for Chambers to offer a pupillage award that was less than their junior tenants. So you can plan financially that way. Um, obviously, there are lots of scholarships out there, um, but that's an indication, good indication of where you might start earning. And then, yes, you do have to, when you're self-employed, you do just have to know that it's your responsibility to build your career. And in, in fact, you want to do that because you want to be able to pick, I want to do personal injury and not um, employment law. So we enjoy the benefits of being self-employed. And so you just have to take that slight uncertainty with it. Just got to be brave, I think, at the end of the day, make the leap. 
Yeah, um, you, you can also just build in the safety net. So if you're organized, you can set up, you know, critical illness cover, mortgage protection, all the separate insurances. You have to set your own pension up. Uh, and the sooner you start it, the better. So you just need a little bit more, you know, organization and planning for yourself. But that's kind of the only downside. And as Krista says, it's just amazing upsides being self-employed and being able to be in control of your own work and your own time. Thank you. I think uh, we are going to have to wrap it up because I think we have run out of time. Um, I, th there is never enough time to, to hear <laughs> everything you want to know about working at the bar. But thank you very much to all three of you uh, for joining us at the, at the, the Target Jobs National Publish Fair. I'm going to ask anybody who's out there watching, could you please say thank you to our panel in the chat boxes? I will recommend they go away and log into the fair so they can see um, the, the comments that have been coming through because it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult for us on the Zoom call. Um, and please do visit their chamber stands if you have time. I think uh, Keating, Henderson um, and Temple Garden all have stands at the virtual fair. So please do drop by and ask any more questions that you have. Um, thank you once again to our panel for joining us. That's the end of the talks program today. Um, I hope you've had a good virtual national pupillage fair. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Bye.